Hi everyone. I'm actually at a picnic, a church picnic, and today is a very special day because it's the first day since the lockdown that our church has had the opportunity to be together and fellowship, connecting with each other. In actual fact, connecting is what I want to talk to you about because in the UPC we're going to start a new program, it's a new initiative to connect people throughout Australia who don't go to any of our churches, who are in isolated towns uh, or even in mines and things like that. We want to connect them with other people of like faith. We've actually found that there are a lot of people out there from different nations and from and who are Australians who actually don't think there's anybody else in the town where they are. Just this past week, within the last two weeks, I've spoken to a man who was in Mount Isa. Uh, his family want to start, uh, start a church and I said we'd do whatever we can. I told Brother Morris about it and then within a couple of days Brother Morris said, hey, we actually know of somebody else at in Mount Isa, so we're in the process of connecting them. So if you know anybody, your friends, uh, those who have been in fellowship with you in the past, whoever they are, just send us a message with their details uh, at contact at upca.org.au. I'll say that again, contact at upca.org.au. That will come to us. We will then follow it up. We will, we will do our best to connect them. If we can't connect them, then we will find somebody who can uh, communicate with them and actually keep them in fellowship. You see, I'm actually so happy to be here today enjoying this fellowship. And yet there's a lot of people out there who are not getting fellowship like this. And it's not because of COVID. It's just purely because of their location. So join us in this, this new initiative. God bless you and thank you very much. My name is Warren Love, and this is my sign name. I am from Calvary Chapel in Canberra. This is my story. I'm deaf, and I grew up in a Christian family. But church was boring, and I, I wasn't happy there. My mum taught me about to read the Bible, and then later, I joined a Jeff, Deaf Christian Fellowship. There was wonderful stories that I could understand there. Stories about Jesus and and his love for me. I went to church and it was so wonderful. I went to a Pentecostal church and received the Holy Spirit. God healed me. His power is in my life. Yes, he loves me and I love him, yes. In 1 Corinthians, chapter 13, Verse 19. And now abides faith, hope, and love. There's these three. The greatest of these is love. God bless you.
Greetings, everybody. Welcome to our second night of the General Conference of the United Pentecostal Church of Australia. And we welcome you from all around Australia and even around the world for joining us for this, our annual event. So why don't we open up in prayer and ask the Lord to bless us. Let the Spirit of God minister to you wherever you are. And let God do a great work in the church. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this great time that we have together. Lord, even though we are separated at different locations, yet we are united as one body in Christ. And so we pray that your Holy Spirit would move in our services, in our midst, Lord God, wherever we are. And let your anointing be upon your singers and musicians, upon the man of God that will bring the word of God to us today. So we give you glory this day. We honor you and worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Let it be our prayer tonight that as we lift our praises unto God, as we worship Him and exalt His holy name, that His glory would just come down and flow upon us and through us. Amen. Let's just worship Him tonight as we give Him praises. Amen.
his righteousness his body was broken for our transgressions but i'm so glad that's not where the story
step out of the grave break into the wild and don't be afraid run into wide open spaces grace is waiting for you dance like the weight has been lifted grace is waiting
truth. Hallelujah. in your life anything is possible in your family and in your church and as we enter into this time of worship as we sing this blessing out over you over your family over your church grab a hold of that and allow that to take root in your heart and make the difference in your situation here today
Once again, we want to thank you for joining with us for our second night of our general conference, our virtual general conference here, the UPCA. And we pray that the ministry of so far has been a blessing to you, and we trust it has been. As we come to the ministry of the preaching of the Word of God, I want to encourage you to open up your hearts and let the Spirit of the Lord minister to you, even though we are separated at different locations, yet we know that there are no boundaries to the presence of God. So receive with faith God's Word today. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker. This great man of God needs no introduction. Being known to many of us, he is a prolific author whose books litter much of apostolic libraries, and he is the general superintendent of the United Pentecostal Church International. And so why don't we open our hearts and let's welcome to this conference, Reverend David Bernard. Thank you. Greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ from the world headquarters of the United Pentecostal Church International in St. Louis, Missouri, USA. I'm especially pleased to greet you, the United Pentecostal Church of Australia, your General Superintendent, Pastor John Downs. Uh, we appreciate Brother and Sister Downs and their leadership and ministry over many years. I also appreciate the invitation of the General Board. It's great to be with you and to greet you. Of course, my wife and I were looking forward to actually coming to Australia once again. We always enjoy our times uh, in your country, and we are looking forward to the fellowship and the ministry together. But COVID-19 has other plans. But God is bigger than anything in this world, and uh, we're glad that we can use technology to still meet together. Uh, uh, my wife and I were also supposed to, or I was supposed to, uh, visit the Pacific region in December, uh, Fiji and Vanuatu, but we've had to postpone that. So hopefully all these plans are postponed for a year, but in all things, we trust the Lord. And I believe God truly has a plan. God is working. Uh, the events of 2020, uh, the pandemic, uh, the resulting economic chaos, uh, social unrest, political uh, upheaval, all of those things took us by surprise, but they didn't take God by surprise. And so now as we enter 2021, uh, we still face uncertainty with the pandemic. We, we hope things will start settling down. Hopefully things will get back to quote normal, whatever that might be, but it's probably going to be a new normal. Probably some adjustments that we are making are, are going to be permanent and uh, probably some issues we're still going to face. We don't really know. And of course, just as we didn't know what was going to happen in 2020. So we don't really know what's going to happen in 2021. And that could be a statement that could cause fear and uncertainty. But I want to tell you that in all these situations, God has a plan and God is more than a match for any situation. So we, as the church, as the people of God, as the people of the name of Jesus, as people who are filled with the spirit, as people who pursue holiness, as people of the one true and living God, we must rise to the occasion. We must put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and we must follow God's plan. Yes, it is important for us to make plans. I firmly believe that. We should pray, study, take counsel together, discern the will of God and make good plans for our local church, for our national organization, for world missions. But having said that, we know from experience, especially this past year, that our plans are likely uh, to be disrupted. If we don't have a plan, however, we're not going to accomplish much of anything. If we do have a plan, which we must, then we should be flexible because we know that our plans are, are going to be changed beyond our understanding. But in those cases, we go to God in prayer and say, Lord, we prayed. We've consecrated ourselves to you. We focused on your mission. Uh, we've unified. We've sought to do your will. We planned. We projected. We've done our best. Uh, we've we raised the necessary funds and we're trusting you. But all of our best plans will not be a success without you. And so, Lord, in these times of uncertain, we tr uncertainty, we trust you to give us wisdom and guidance. We trust you to supersede our plans and fulfill your purpose. And God will do just that. 
I'd like to turn your attention to 1 Kings chapter 19, which illustrates uh, what I want to say. It's the story of the prophet Elijah. I'll just pick an excerpt uh, from the story for the sake of getting started. It's found in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 15 and 16. God's instructions to Elijah when he was in the wilderness. 1 Kings 19, 15. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Amobehola, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. In essence, God gave instructions to Elijah while he was hiding in the wilderness, in the mountains, and said, anoint a new king for Syria, anoint a new king for Israel, and anoint a prophet to be your successor. And so here's my message today. God has a plan. I'd like to encourage you that in every situation, in every circumstance, God has a plan. Remember, God always has a plan. When we look at the story of Elijah, of course, we see from chapter 18 that he won great victory over the 850 false prophets on Mount Carmel. As you know the story, they decided to test who is the true God. Is it Baal or is it Jehovah, Yahweh? And it, they were on Mount Carmel, which was known as the home of the God Baal. I think it's interesting that when Elijah uh, challenged these false prophets, and of course, when you read carefully, you'll find that everything he did was at God's command. It wasn't his own initiative. It wasn't just something he dreamed up. But God had instructed him to do this. So he challenged the false prophets of Baal and the false prophets of the goddess uh, Ashtoreth. And he said, let's test to see who is the true God. Let's pray to our respective gods and the God who truly answers with fire from heaven. He is the true God. And it's, I think it's interesting that he went on the devil's turf. He went on the enemy's territory, went to the mountain where the followers of Baal believed their God resided. And he said, I'll challenge you on your alleged God's own territory. And I think that's interesting. We as a church don't have to be in defensive mode, but we can go anywhere and everywhere throughout the world in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we can be victorious. And so, of course, God did answer by fire. Baal never did because Baal is not a true God. And so all Israel saw, at least for that time, that Jehovah is the true God. What an amazing victory. What an amazing vindication. What an amazing revival. And the prophets, the false prophets were slaughtered. The true prophet was vindicated. And at least for that moment, the worship of Yahweh was restored in the land of Israel. Of course, right after that, Jezebel, the wicked queen, threatened to kill Elijah. And so he fled for his life. He ran as far as he could go. He fell exhausted under a tree and then he prayed to die. Uh, as others have pointed out, it's, it's somewhat ironic. Elijah said, go ahead and kill me, Lord. He didn't really believe that. He was just speaking from discouragement, depression, and physical, and mental, and spiritual exhaustion. Because if he, really, if he really did want to die, all he had to do was wait for Jezebel and her minions to catch up with him. And they would uh, fulfill his request. But God knew his frailty. God knows that we're humans. God knows our weaknesses. And so instead of rebuking him, as, as God certainly could have done, God could have said, Elijah, I've given you this incredible victory. Can't you just trust me to protect you now? But God didn't rebuke him. God understood his weakness and his struggle. God sent an angel. The angel gave him food, drink, time to rest. And then after that, Elijah traveled to a cave in the wilderness on Mount Horeb, where he was perfectly safe from Jezebel or any other enemy. And then, of course, God spoke to him out of that in that time and asked, what are you doing? What are you doing here? Elijah gave a complaint. He was still frustrated. And uh, if you look in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 through 10, you see that uh, Elijah's 
reply to God isn't very, uh, isn't very faith-filled, but somewhat complaining. Um, so the word of the Lord came in verse 9, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, verse 10, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. In other words, God, you know why I'm here. I'm here because of you. I stood up for you. I did your will. I stood strong. And now they're trying to attack me and kill me because of my faith in you. In fact, they've killed all the other prophets. They've killed everyone else that has worshiped you. I'm the only one left and they're trying to kill me too. In other words, what do you mean? Why am I hiding in a cave on the mountain in the wilderness? I'm here because of you. I'm here because I did what you wanted and look what's happened. All of your people have been destroyed. I'm the only one left and I'm getting ready to die myself. And so God began to speak to him in that negative condition. And I don't want to pause and say a couple things, several things that might be relevant to us. The first thing I notice is that there is a battle after the victory. You know, we believe God for victory. We believe God for breakthroughs, for revival, for planting new churches, for church growth, for souls to be saved. For miracles. And we have many such testimonies. That's been the history of our church uh, from the very beginning. God has done great things in our midst. But sometimes we don't think about it that after a great advance, after a great victory, after wonderful plans are fulfilled, sometimes there's a battle after the victory. And in such times, uh, we need physical, emotional, and even spiritual renewal. We can't make it on our own. We realize that after a discouragement or a defeat or a struggle or a trial that we need God's help. But sometimes we don't realize that after great victory, we still need God's help. And so sometimes we need to remind ourselves of our need to depend upon God. So in this situation, here is Elijah. God did give him the food, the drink, the rest that he needed. But he still is struggling with the right attitude. And so God begins to deal with him. God obviously knows that he doesn't have the best attitude. And so the Lord says, okay, I want you to stand on this mountain. A great wind came. And uh, you can imagine how afraid Elijah must have been to stand on that slope and see the howling wind that was actually strong enough to possibly even blow him off the mountain and kill him. To see boulders start crashing as the wind dislodged them, maybe to see objects flying in the air. No doubt he huddled against the rock and perhaps put his cloak over his head and tried to, to survive until the wind would pass. And then after the wind, God sent an earthquake. And again, you can imagine cracks forming in the ground, boulders crashing, and Elijah is afraid of, for his life. And then after that earthquake, the fire came. And so we can imagine the brush on the mountainside, the trees exploding, the fire all around him, perhaps lightning, uh, electrical storm. And once again, Elijah's in danger for his life. So uh, Elijah sees these dramatic manifestations and occurrences. He recognizes the awesome power of God. And he no doubt expects God to speak in such uh, amazing circumstances, such awesome circumstances. But after everything calms down, then God speaks in a still, small voice. And God asks the same question. And Elijah gives the same answer. But reading between the lines, there must have been a change of attitude. I think Elijah says the same thing, but with some humility. Instead of anger, complaining, he says, I'm here alone. I'm afraid. They're seeking to take my life. I don't know what to do. And it's at that moment that God gives him the instructions that I just read to you as my text. God takes Elijah alone, fearful, hiding, not knowing what to do. His faith is weak because it seems that God has forsaken him and he's shortly going to die. But then God speaks and says, no, Elijah, I want you to go out of this cave, out of the wilderness, 
go back to the scene of action, go back to society, the very place where you're so fearful, I'm going to use you. You're afraid of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, but I want you to anoint people that will overthrow their regime. You're concerned whether you will even survive, but you will survive. Your ministry will survive and it will extend to future generations. In fact, you're going to have a successor that's con going to continue your ministry even after you're gone. You're thinking everything is about ready to end right now, but I've got a plan for the future. I've got a plan that will take care of you, but also your ministry and the future work of God. And so I see another point here that God speaks in various ways, often in a way we least expect. So through the difficulties that we've been going through lately, uh, we've had to make so many adjustments but yet God can speak in every circumstance, even in ways we least expect. And then, of course, my next point is my main point. God always has a plan. The situation isn't hopeless. God always has purpose, plan, meaning and future. And I will also say God always has a people. Elijah felt that he was the only one left, but Jesus said, no, your, your mathematics is a little wrong. Not just one. I have 7,000 who've never bowed down to Baal. We are not alone. It may seem that in our local situation that we are alone, but we are not alone. And then I noticed from this story that God doesn't reveal his plan until we are ready to receive it. We would like God to reveal the future. We would like God to reveal the whole year and what's going to happen and what trial will come and how we'll deal with that. But that's not how God chooses to operate. I suspect that if God did reveal some things, we'd be so overwhelmed, we'd just quit in discouragement. Or if we saw some victories, we would get so, so lifted up and, and boastful that again, we would lose what God has for us. So instead, God asked us to walk by faith. We don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. We must trust God. There's never a place in our ministry where we don't need to trust God. In fact, I've learned that no matter where you go in ministry, no matter how much you succeed in, in your goals in ministry, there are times where God will bring you back to zero, so to speak. There will be times where God brings you back to your first consecration and say, are you willing to trust me? Are you willing to let go of your dreams and seek my will? Are you willing to change the course of your ministry or walk away from some of the things you've accomplished in order to go further into my will? I believe every one of us periodically have to face the question, are you simply willing to trust me no matter what? So God has a plan, but he doesn't always reveal his plan until we're ready to receive it. And then finally, I want to point out God's plan will return us to the scene of action. Yes, there are times where we must retreat in solitude and prayer, fasting, contemplation, even times of rest and relaxation. They, these times are very important to us. There are times of regrouping. Perhaps you've seen this as I've talked to many pastors uh, that during uh, 2020, there was kind of a regrouping. We couldn't get together as much as we would like. Uh, and when we we're able to have attendance uh, in person, it wasn't as great as normally. And we weren't able to have the large meetings that we wanted to have. And there are some people on the fringes that seemingly we've lost. Um, and, and so there've been, there've been some losses. There's been some discouragement. There's been some lessening of objective measurements of success. Perhaps we've also had some to pass away. And here in the United States, we've had uh, a number of our saints and an increasing number of our ministers who have died of COVID-19. We're thankful for many miraculous testimonies. And we're thankful that, that by and large, the church is strong. Financially, we've remained strong. I'm happy to say our missions giving has stayed steady and even increased. And so by all measurements, uh, the, the church is coming through this crisis with great strength, poised for even greater revival. 
So even in the midst of struggle and chaos and confusion and unrest and limitation, the church is strong and we see a clear path forward. However, part of what has happened perhaps this past month or past few months, past year, is a little regrouping, a little time to think, to pray, to seek God, perhaps some time of forced inaction. And those times are good and necessary. But ultimately, God's will is not for us to hide and wait and simply try to survive until the Lord comes. But he wants us to thrive. He wants to move out of our comfort zone. He wants us to be aggressive. He wants to believe God for the unknown. He wants us to conquer new territory for the name of Jesus. So I'm here to say that we will aggressively move forward in the spirit. We will see what God wants to do. We will have revival because God has a plan that's greater than mere existence. That's greater than mere survival. But God's plan is for the gospel to be preached in the whole world until the end comes. Praise the Lord. God has a plan. And I'm happy to tell you that worldwide, the United Pentecostal Church International is still fulfilling our mission of the whole gospel to the whole world by the whole church. And I'm so thankful that the United Pentecostal Church of Australia has been part of that mission for many, many years. You've taken uh, the initiative and the responsibility, not in, only in Australia, in every part of your land, uh, going into the outback, going uh, into the cities, uh, establishing new churches. But you've also extended to Papua New Guinea. You've also extended to Timor-Leste. And you, you've also uh, partnered with Indonesia and uh, other areas of the Pacific. And you've got representatives from various islands of the Pacific that are in the church. So you've done your part in your area as well as extending beyond partnering with churches such as Northeast India. And I appreciate that. I'm happy to tell you that this is indeed the, the mission and the vision of the United Pentecostal Church International. There are 210 nations of the world as identified by the Population Reference Bureau. I'm happy to tell you we've continued to extend our presence. We are now in 198 of the 210 nations. That means only 12 have no witness, uh, at least as far as the UPCI is concerned. But we are aggressively working to, to reach those remaining 12. Most of them are very small some are island nations of low populations. Some are very heavily Muslim nations where it's challenging to find an open door. But I will tell you without being specific, in the last few years, we've found, been able to find ways to get in many of the Muslim nations that were closed, often through uh, our own church members in existing Muslim nations who can reach into areas where it's difficult for those in the West uh, to travel. And so God is helping us. We're also in 34 territories for a total of 232 nations and territories. Our constituency is now over 5 million. We have over, well over 42,000 churches and preaching points. It's exciting to see what God is doing. So even in the midst of difficult circumstances, the church has continued to grow. In April of 2020, when, uh, 2020, when um, COVID-19 began to hit the whole world, um, I, we had many meetings scheduled in Latin America, particularly. The time of Easter is the time of most of the annual conferences. And so we were not able to have those in person. Instead, we did an online service in Spanish. And I'm happy to tell you, we made an evangelistic appeal and uh, we had over 100,000 views and contacts for those online services. And we saw over 1,200 people receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost are being renewed in the Holy Ghost through those services. In May of 2020, the weekend of the day of Pentecost, we decided to do online services in English and Spanish. Again, well over or approximately 100,000 views and contacts. This time we had over 2,400 receive the Holy Ghost or be renewed in the spirit. So I just mentioned that as an example to show you that even though circumstances may restrict us, 
the, the word of God is not so restricted. The book of Acts ends with Paul under house arrest in the city of Rome. But it also ends by saying the word of God was not bound. He was able to minister the word of God freely. And as some have pointed out, the book of Acts doesn't end with an amen because the implication is it's still going on. We may, the church may be in difficult circumstances. We may suffer various limitations economically, politically, medically, socially, but God's word is not bound. God will make a way where there is no way. God has a plan. I challenge you in your local church, in your city, in your nation, God is working. And if plan A doesn't seem to work, God's already got plan B. If one door is shut, that means God is opening another door. But we shouldn't be quick to give up. If the door seems to be shut, why don't we knock on the door? Because the Lord says, knock and it shall be open. If you have to knock, there's an implication the door is shut. So don't quickly walk away from the shut door. Maybe it is God's way of telling you to go another direction. But maybe it's God's way of saying, persevere, ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Matthew 7, 7. Maybe we're supposed to be a little more aggressive in our prayers. Maybe we're supposed to seek. Maybe we're supposed to knock. Maybe we're supposed to push until something happens. Praise God. Because God has a plan. And so I believe it's time for faith. It's time for renewal. It's time to hear the still, small voice of God. But then when we hear that voice, it's time for action. We cannot just stay where we are. We cannot just hide and wait uh, to survive. But somehow we must hear from God. And once we hear from God, then we need to act. Praise God. Praise God. As I've thought about all the things that have happened in 2020 and all the disruptions of the worldwide pandemic, I think we can learn some lessons. I've shared these elsewhere, but let me just briefly point out a few things. I believe God is showing us the importance of several things. Number one, the importance of personal connections in home ministry, small group ministry. Uh, I think we've always known that to some extent and indeed, in the book of Acts, we see the church met publicly, but also from house to house. We need to be reminded that while we love the large conferences and while we believe it's important to have large church gatherings, church services, yet there's also a component that's not simply in the public gathering or the public worship, but it's through the one-on-one -on -one connections, the home Bible studies, the home fellowship or friendship groups, the, the home devotions of the family. And I believe God is reminding us of the importance of personal connections, home ministry, small groups. The second thing I think God is showing us the importance of an online presence. This was unknown to the apostles, but that's been the case um, throughout the history of the church. We've used methods that were not known to the apostles. The apostles didn't have the printing press. They didn't have the automobile. They didn't have the airplane. They didn't have public church buildings. They didn't have the microphone. They didn't have video technology. But as each of those things has come, while those technologies have been used for evil, they can also be used for good. And I think God is telling the church to reach the almost 8 billion people of the world. We're going to have to be innovative. And perhaps through video and uh, internet, we can reach people that have never been reached before. I believe that's already happening. I believe thousands of people have visited an apostolic church service virtually that have never been exposed to the apostolic message. People have heard the full gospel. There have been some who've fallen away from the Lord that have been reluctant to come to church, but through an online service, they've been able to find their way back into fellowship with God's people. And so we're seeing people being renewed in the spirit. And of course, uh, once they're renewed, then they are restored to the fellowship of the church, not merely virtually, but in reality. The general conference of the, that we held here in the U.S., we celebrated the 75th anniversary 
of the founding of the United Pentecostal Church. And of course, we were planning for a great celebration in St. Louis, but we had to shift everything online. Despite that, what that means is our services and our seminars have been made online in a greater way, and especially optimized for online viewing. So that was a first for us to have a completely online conference. And we don't know all the significance of the various measurements, but according to the social media measurements, we had over 114,000 unique views. And to whatever extent that represents people, we don't know exactly how that translates. I do know that there are many groups, uh, family groups or even entire churches who watch together on one device. So who knows how many people are reached, but I'm confident it's more than have ever been reached in any one service of general conference anywhere. And so I'm thankful that God is helping us to reach people in innovative ways. So that's, that's another lesson I think we've learned. The third thing we've been reminded of the importance of organization and unity. I don't think you have to belong to the United Pentecostal Church to be saved or to have a valid ministry, but I do believe that it's scriptural for us to be united, to work together, to have mutual submission, to have godly leadership, to have organization and structure, to be united as Acts chapter two demonstrates. Acts 2, 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, breaking of bread and in prayers. They assembled together. And because of our unity, we've been able to continue support for our missionaries all across the world, including domestically. We've been able to support evangelists. We've been able to support new churches, home missions churches, struggling churches. We've been able to reach out financially and support all aspects of the work of God that we couldn't do if we weren't united. I'm happy to tell you our worldwide missions effort has just continued to go forward. God has supplied the need in many different ways, sometimes miraculously. We've also learned and particularly in the United States, we've learned the importance of political and social engagement. Uh, it's not our job to be politicians or to promote parties or candidates, but we've got to be engaged in our community because we have to protect our religious freedom. We have to protect our freedom of assembly, freedom of speech. We have to make our voice heard. The church can't be left out. The church can't be ignored, but somehow we need influence in our communities and God is giving us effective ways that we can have positive influence. And then finally, I would say, We've been reminded it's not a new lesson, but we've learned the importance of prayer. No matter what happens, we must pray. We need God's wisdom. We need God's guidance. We need the power that comes from him. We are not smart enough to know what to do in these uncertain times, but God has a plan. We're not powerful enough to fulfill uh, what we think needs to happen. We can't make things happen by our own human ability. No, we're not strong enough to push the right levers in politics or social life to get what we want, so to speak. But we know that God will anoint us to accomplish his will. And so once again, we're reminded of the need of prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so I just want to remind you, United Pentecostal Church of Australia, God has a plan. He has a plan for your city, for your congregation. He has a plan for Australia. He has a plan for the Pacific, and you are a big part of that plan. He has a plan for the United Pentecostal Church International. He has a plan for our world. No matter the circumstances, God's in control. Trust in him. God has a plan. Let's follow his plan. God has a plan for your life and your ministry. It's amazing what God can do in every situation. I'd like to share a simple testimony. I shared when I preached the general conference message in St. Louis, perhaps some of you heard it, but there was a young man from a Muslim country. And just to make a long story short, he immigrated to another country where we have churches that operate freely. But he was an atheist. Nevertheless, his mother had got converted in our church. She insisted that he come to church. He said he would on one condition. He had a list of 50 reasons why he didn't believe in God. 
He said, I'll come to your church for the first time, but I want to talk to your pastor. And if he expects me to come back, he's going to have to answer those 50 questions. He's going to have to explain those 50 reasons why there is no God. He's going to have to counteract them and give me an answer. But as this young man personally related to my wife and me, when he walked in the service, he felt something he never felt before. And he soon tears began flowing down his cheeks. And he wondered at first, what's going on? Why, why am I crying? What's, what's wrong? But then he realized for the first time in his life, he was feeling the presence of God. As he told me later, he said, Pastor Bernard, in that moment, God answered all 50 questions. I didn't need to talk to the pastor about why I should believe in God. I knew from that experience that God is real, that he exists, that he was reaching for me. Obviously, um, as the story, you, you can know the rest of the story. He was soon baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, received the gift of the Holy Spirit, and he's in our church today working for God. There's another story that also happened. I was preaching back in the church that I started, A New Life in Austin, Texas, and Pastor Shaw related the story to me. Uh, a young man came there uh, that morning, uh, and I, don't, I, didn't know, uh, I didn't know him, didn't meet him, but heard the story later. And he had been a practicing Buddhist for 23 years. And he would meditate according to the Buddhist tradition. And in one of his meditation sessions, he encountered forces of evil. It shocked him, surprised him. He became fearful and afraid. It was apparently a demonic spirit. And evidently he must have been sincere in his search for truth, even though he didn't really know God, didn't know truth. He was disturbed. He was seeking more. He knew something is wrong, but he didn't know what was wrong or how to fix it. So God was gracious to him. And one night gave him a vision. In the vision, an angelic being spoke to him and said, your answer is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Savior. You need to seek Him. He woke up from that dream. He decided to find a Christian church. He found a large denominational church, began attending for about six months. But he wasn't really finding the power that he needed. He wasn't finding the answers that he needed. He began to tell people he was looking for something more. And somebody said, it sounds like you need a Pentecostal church. So he went online. He searched for a Pentecostal church in Austin. He found new life and he showed up that morning. And as he later told Pastor Shaw, he said, when I walked in the door, I realized this is what I've been looking for. He felt the presence of God. And sure enough, that night he was baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he came up out of the water, Pastor Shaw laid hands on him. He received the Holy Ghost. He began speaking in tongues as the initial sign, as the Spirit gave utterance. I related those two testimonies briefly to tell you that God's plan goes above and beyond anything we can do. Yes, we need to plan. In those two examples, we had a church. We had a pastor. We had a building. We had a structure. We had schedule. If we didn't do our part, then these testimonies wouldn't have taken place. But even though we did our part, there's no way we could know who's coming and plan a careful strategy tailored to that person's need. But that's okay. We don't have to know everything. We don't have to plan everything. We don't have to have a strategy for everything because God has a plan. God knew exactly who would come. He knew exactly what they would need. At the right time, God moved in a miraculous way above and beyond our knowledge, above and beyond our ability, and God accomplished his purpose. And so we, the church, were able to baptize these people in Jesus' name, to pray for them, to receive the Holy Ghost, to incorporate them into the church and disciple them. So we have a very important role to play. But we can be confident that God is working above and beyond anything we can know. That is not only true in individual testimonies. That's also true in the life of a church. That's also true in your ministry. That's also true for the entire United Pentecostal Church of Australia. So I challenge you, make your plans. 
I challenge you to pray, to study, to work together, to meet together, to plan your strategy of how you're going to start more churches, how you're going to reach new ter- territory, how you're going to grow the existing churches, how you're going to break through barriers, how you're going to train uh, leaders, and uh, how you're going to operate your Bible college, and how you're going to disciple new converts, and all the many things that are necessary. But in the midst of it all, realize God has a plan that's greater than our plan. That God is at work if we will keep praying, if we'll keep believing. When you don't know what else to do, keep doing what you know to do. Keep worshiping, keep preaching, keep teaching, and God is going to fulfill his plan. Despite the circumstances, and maybe even because of circumstances, Because I believe these circumstances have caused us to pray and trust God more than ever before. And I believe these circumstances have caused many people to be more open and more hungry and more desirous of reality and truth than ever before. So I believe we have a great opportunity for increasing revival. After all, God has a plan. May God bless you in Jesus' name. Why don't we pray right now? Why don't we seek God together? Lord, fulfill your purpose in our lives. You know every obstacle. You know every struggle. You know every trial. Lord, give us wisdom and strength to go through every circumstance. But Lord, help us to seize the opportunities in our lives and in our churches. Lord, help us to expand the kingdom of God. Fulfill your purpose, Lord. Fulfill your plan. We need your strength. We need your power. We need the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And we seek you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.